All right, technology is caught up to us, so I'd like to welcome everybody for uh, coming today for our May meeting. We've got a lot of things on the agenda. First of all, we'd like to uh, say our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Today we will do our financial report. We have a special presentation from uh, Boardwalk Village. Uh, Teresa Dirksen is here for the Lake Restoration Committee and Ag Solutions. Uh, Jasmine Grossnickel is going to be talking about a, a topic that is uh, very popular here at the lake, which is birding. And then we'll have our park updates from Dave Failer. And uh, I'll make a few mentions at the end about other activities coming up. Uh, at this time, I'd like to have uh, Ted Berkey come up and he can talk about our, uh, our financial situation. Good morning. Um, not a lot of change. All our bills are paid. Uh, we just recently donated $1,750 to the Get the Carp Out. Um, right at this time, we have $58,432.53 in checking. And we have $21,896.94 in the Community Foundation in St. Mary. So we're cash rich. We're looking for projects. Um, any questions? No, we don't pay mortgages. <laughs> Thank you, Ted. Uh, we have a new construction going on in the West Bank, as everybody's probably seen. It lives around the uh, Sliner St. Mary's area. Uh, we uh, figured that a lot of people would be curious what's going on, so we contacted them, and uh, we have today, we have Brianna Obringer here to kind of give an overview of what's, what's going on, and, uh, and her uh, co-worker, Nikki. So when you guys want to come up, you can kind of talk about what's happening on West Bank. All right, hi everyone. I just wanna first off say my name is Brianna Olbringer. I'm the marketing coordinator for Boardwalk Village and also Bruns Construction Enterprises, which is the developer of Boardwalk Village on West Bank. And I'm here with Nikki Herring. She is our property manager for Bruns Construction and Boardwalk Village. So you'll be seeing a lot of her as well. Um, first off, I just wanna say thank you guys for having us. Um, and I wanna say thanks to the Lake Improvement Association for everything they're doing. We really want to be involved as much as we can, Boardwalk Village, to show our support. And we're just really thankful for everything you guys are doing for the lake and Grand Lake. Um, so we're just going to briefly talk about kind of what Boardwalk Village is and just break it down. And Nikki's kind of going to talk about what the future of Boardwalk Village looks like. So um, as you're seeing on the screen here, that is obviously a drone shot of construction. So if you're not familiar, Boardwalk Village is located on West Bank Road in Salina, Ohio, just right past uh, the Boardwalk Grill. So as you can see, it's very, very colorful, um, and it's inspired by Key West in Florida, if you're familiar with cottages and lots of colors and things like that. So pretty soon here in the next couple weeks, we'll be bringing in some palm trees and everything will really be coming together to uh, kind of see and bring that uh, feel and inspiration of the Key West um, together. So right now we are in phase one construction. We are finishing it up here in the next month. Um, phase one consists of eight cottages. Five of them are smaller and three of them are large. The smaller ones are approximately 800 square feet and the larger ones are approximately 1400 square feet. All of the units that we have can accommodate between six to eight guests. And then also if you see that building in the back there, that is a townhome unit. So there are six units and the two end ones are three story penthouses and the four in the middle are two story townhomes. So a lot of people have been asking us if we're selling any of the units and right now phase one is all vacation rentals. So there's 14 total units and we're open right now for booking. Um, we have a website boardwalkvillage.com and then we're also on VRBO and Airbnb. So we're really happy right now. We're looking at um, approximately, I asked Nikki a couple days ago, we're at like 130 reservations so far um, and obviously looking for that to grow. 
The cottages will open uh, June 1st. I believe we'll be seeing our first guest on June 2nd, mm -hmm. correct? And the townhome is looking to open the end of July, probably July 25th. Um, so that's kind of what that looks like. You'll see kind of um, on the pictures here, I'll try to switch to another slide. That is the townhome unit. Um, you can see the three stories and then the four, the two stories in the middle there. Um, so that's what that is. This is kind of an interior sneak peek of the large cottage. Um, obviously no decorations or anything, but we, we are getting that together. That's kind of another view there of the large cottage, just very open and airy on the inside and then the colorfulness on the outside. Um, I'll just go back to this. So like I said, uh, phase one, we are finishing up building. Um, we have a pool going in on the inside and a pool house. So that will be uh, for our guests to use. There'll be some grilling stations, seating areas. So really we want to look at Boardwalk Village as a walkable community. There's gonna be lots of sidewalk paths and, and we wanna really be able to connect with the downtown and the small businesses and really bring awareness to Grand Lake St. Mary's. That's one of our biggest goals is to just bring awareness to the community in Grand Lake. Um, and also to provide a, another um, set of lodging and place for people to come and visit and stay. Uh, with our reservations that we're seeing right now, we're seeing a large diverse uh, demographic of people reserving, whether they're coming to visit the area and, and uh, boat on Lake St. Grand Lake, um, they're coming for weddings, to visit family events, or just to have a family reunion or get together. So we're really, really happy to see that diverse demographic and age range, and we hope that kind of continues on. So that's what that looks like. Um, if you're interested, we are hosting a uh, grand opening event on Friday, May 27th. That is free and open to the public. Um, we're gonna be able to have everyone uh, kind of go through all of our different types of units that we have um, and just really kind of celebrate our opening um, of Boardwalk Village and just kind of kick off Memorial Day weekend. So if you guys wanna learn more about Boardwalk Village, um, we have a website, boardwalkvillage.com. We're also on Facebook and Instagram and Nikki and I are always available for any questions that you guys may have. So I think that's it for me. I'm gonna pass it on to Nikki. She's gonna talk a little bit about our future marketplace that we're looking to put in and our corporate rentals that we're looking to do. So take it away, Nikki. Thanks, Brianna. Um, so I'm the property manager for Boardwalk Village. I handle all of the reservations and guest communication. Um, I just wanted to touch upon just briefly on a couple additional opportunities that we're offering at Boardwalk Village. Um, so the first one, as Brianna said, we've got over 130 reservations already, and that's primarily the summertime, obviously. It's our busy season on the lake. Um, we wanted to, you know, get creative with what are we going to do off-season. So we wanted to offer an opportunity um, for our off-season um, time slots for corporate rentals. So basically providing um, convenient lodging options for those who are coming to the area for work, whether it be a long work trip or if they're relocating, um, anything along those lines. And it doesn't have to be strictly just for, um, you know, companies in the area. So we do have options for a longer term um, rental lodging option for uh, at Boardwalk Village. So we're thinking between October and March. So if you know of anyone, pass along the word. We'll also provide some literature up here that you can take away. Um, and uh, yeah, we're just trying to get the word out for that. And then um, we also eventually will have a boardwalk marketplace if you haven't heard already. So eventually that will be a collection of retail shops with multiple food options, beverages, games, ice cream, boutiques, all of that good stuff. We're, we're thinking about that being um, developed come next year. Um, that's still in the plans and the workings. But in the meantime, we didn't want to wait a whole year to you know, get some potential vendors in. So. Um, we're doing a little bit something unique here with um, offering um, incubator shed space, spaces for um, smaller businesses. So like, you know, there's a lot of folks out here who work out of their homes, whether they're doing like bakeries or um, souvenir gifts, things like that. We would love to see that boardwalk. So we wanted to offer just a, um, a low risk option for those merchants to come in and, and rent a space for, you know, just a a short period of time six month leases so we are looking for you know water sport rentals kayak rentals um, souvenir shops convenience general store those kinds of merchants so again if you guys know of anyone I'm the one that you'd want to reach out for that my cards gonna be up here as well so 
just to, I guess, kind of end, um, like I said, boardwalkvillage.com will be your place to go if you're ever interested in uh, more information. Um, if you want to pass along, if you have family or friends coming to look for a place to stay in the area, we're also on Facebook and Instagram. And like I said, Nikki and I are available at any point in time for any questions if you uh, have any and you want to reach out. Thank you guys so much for having us. Question? Yeah, any yeah, go ahead. Yes, so we have um, some boat slips that are coming in. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we have some um, boat slips that are coming in in the coming weeks. Actually, they'll be installed. So we'll have um, a total of 12 that our guests can rent out. So, yes. Okay. Yeah. I just learned when I was growing up, there was six small cottages right in that same area. And they're the same pastel colors you got on there. Did you find that paint you had left over? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. We may have to ask uh, Randy Bruns about that. I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe that was a little bit of the inspiration, too, to bring that back. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Thank you guys Thanks. so much. I want to thank uh, Boardwalk Village for uh, they joined the LAA this week and gave a donation. So they are, they are one of our members. And... Uh, they have expressed interest in being very active in the LIA, so that, uh, usually that's all you got to say. We'll be knocking on your door. Um, the, there's a lot of good uh, businesses also located in that area, uh, members of the LIA. I just want to make mention of them. Uh, Bella's Italian Restaurant has been one of our members for years. And uh, they do a lot for us. Um, they're a very nice business. The West Bank Inn, also a member. Uh, they, uh, they donated towards our uh, scavenger hunt last year and Roamers, who donates their hall to us at our dance. So uh, there are several other uh, LIA members in that area, and we don't want to cite them, but we just knew a lot of people. There would probably be a lot of interest on what's going on there with the, uh, with the Boardwalk Village. One of the people uh, responsible for the renovation of this lake and making it come back and bringing businesses to the lake uh, is our next speaker, and that's Teresa Dirksen. I'd like to mention also that uh, if you go to uh, lakeimprovement.com, you can see our whole presentation, and you can go back and look at them pictures if you want to look at those pictures a little bit more uh, uh, more intensely to see the inside of the cottages and things like that. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, um, I'm just going to give a brief update um, of what's happening with some of the projects around the lake. Unfortunately, it's been a pretty wet spring, so we haven't been able to get a whole lot done yet this year. Um, but I do want to first mention uh, the channel planting program that the LIA is offering to their membership. Um, I think today's the last day to order plants if you're interested. And those will be available um, next month uh, after the June meeting. Uh, we'll be out in the parking lot with all of those plants for um, those of you that have ordered. So please be, plan to be here um, by 11 or 11.15 next uh, month on in, at the June meeting. So the goal there is to get um, those wetland plants planted along the shoreline of Grand Lake St. Mary's. Um, and we will also be doing a planting at the Prairie Creek Phase Two Littoral Wetland um, the day prior to the LIA meeting. So, so let's get into projects. Um, this is the Burntwood Lang and Camp Wetland Conservation Area. This is a photo from actually Monday of this week. Um, like I said, it's been too wet to get in there and finish up. We've got a lot of tiles to cut back um, and we're putting in a pump station. We are going to retool our inlet notch um, to, from Burntwood Creek and just complete our final seedings out there. So we have a lot of work to finish up. It's all quick jobs, but we really need the ground conditions to dry out. And I'm hopeful by uh, maybe not this week. We get this week to dry out. The following week we'll actually be able to get in there with some equipment and get that done. Um, I am going to start working on the signage for the site and um, doing some additional wetland plantings and things um, to kind of beautify um, the parking lot side of, of the project. So we're moving forward with that one and hopefully we'll do some sort of event 
um, later in the year, or we'll see how things go. Kind of playing it by year at this point. So that brings me to Chickasaw Creek Wetlands and Stream Restoration Project. This is basically a schematic of what we have intentions for um, on that property, which will treat water from both uh, Big Chick and Little Chick. Um, we are waiting to do our final field work uh, for, to complete that final design and hone in on that final design. I think our consultants are planning to be out on May 17th uh, to do that final field work. And um, shortly after that, we should be able to come with our, our final design and engineering plans. My goal is to get this bid out for construction by late summer. And then we'll begin construction in the fall with likely just um, some of the tree removal in the necessary areas. We're gonna minimize that to just as much as we need to get the construction completed. And um, the actual earthwork probably won't happen until summer of 2023. Mercer Wildlife is another big project we're working on. This is an H2 Ohio funded project, uh, as is the Burnt Wood project. Um, phase one, which is what you see on um, the left-hand side of the screen, is gonna be about 11 acres of wetlands added to the front of the wildlife area along 703. And then we're gonna keep about 20 acres as farmable acres. We're gonna subsurface drain that and control that with um, water control structures. Um, but everything that comes out of that field will enter the wetlands for treatment before it goes back into Grand Lake St. Mary's. Um, phase two is gonna happen probably next year. Uh, we are finishing up the final design and plan to put this out for bid Hopefully this summer, once we have the permits and everything in line, um, it's gonna be somewhere about six to seven acres of additional wetland on top of the existing 10 acres of wetland that we have um, on site existing. Um, but we're calling this a green tree marsh because all these wetlands will be connected and we'll be able to flood out some of the trees there on a very short term basis because we don't wanna kill the trees. Um, we'll be able to manage that and it'll be a really nice um, Really nice wildlife area. Yes. The white things, those are just contour lines. Those are just marking the contour lines of the, it's just an engineering plan. And is that 127? Yes. On the bottom and then 703? Yeah, okay. so. So that's the old. Uh, this is 127 right here and this is 703. This is 703 right here. So this is, it's its road right here. So this is phase one. We've got two pockets of wetlands here. This will remain in farm ground. Um, and we just, we're putting kind of a berm here to control the drainage that comes off of here. So, and then this will be, this will all be wetlands, additional wetlands here. That'll be connected to this existing wetland. Uh, as far as manure nutrient recovery, uh, I always talk about this. We're something we still are working on. Um, in 2021, we did a project in the watershed on a swine farm. We're kind of continuing that research. The ultimate goal being um, somewhat of a mobile unit that can travel from farm to farm, uh, removing nutrients from the manure. So this summer, we will be in Indiana working on a dairy farm, a swine farm, and a mixed manure uh, holding pond. And just advancing that research, looking at that continued recovery and working on that mobile unit. And then with that, the technology has looked at ammonia recovery as well. So we're looking at another option to demonstrate their ammonia recovery piece as well. So we're continuing to advance this. Um, we're not quite where we want it to be yet, but I'm hopeful that the near future um, we'll have some really exciting things happening in this manure treatment, manure nutrient recovery space. Um, hopefully, like I said, later this year, we'll have some, some really good advances in this. Uh, briefly wanted to talk about the Gill and Nature Preserve Wetland. This was funded through Ohio EPA 319 grant. It is completed uh, for the most part. We have some final items um, to finish up. And then 
wants to signage is here we'll plan an event sometime this summer as a kind of a grand opening there is a walking path on this site that's open to the public so we're excited for that I don't know how much uh, Dave plans to talk about West Beach, um, but we have a lot that's going to be happening here um, in the near future. We've got a playground on order, a floating dock, a kayak launch. Um, Dave's got guys going to be working on a kayak basketball um, within the water, beach volleyball, signage. And um, what I really wanted to talk about was the treatment plans for this year. We're partnering with OSU, and they're going to be doing ozone with nanobubbles in the area. I think maybe they've already started um, on the west side of, or the east side of the beach, and then uh, they'll be adding units to the west side as well. So that'll be kind of what we're watching this summer, how well that technology works for treatment in this specific area. So we're looking forward to that one. Um, I also wanted to mention we are planning an event to bring all the state directors and a lot of the legislators here to Grand Lake St. Mary's on May 19th. So we have a, a bunch of exciting tours planned for them. We wanna keep them engaged in Grand Lake St. Mary's to make sure they continue to fund important projects and uh, be advocates for Grand Lake St. Mary's because we know there's a lot of pressure on Lake Erie right now. That seems to be what they're focused on. So we wanna make sure they're on top of Grand Lake uh, St. Mary's as well. So uh, we'll be doing that on May 19th. Excited to have them here. Is there any questions for me? Yeah, so the, yeah, the question is about the problems at Indian Lake with some of the vegetation and the species that we're going to be introducing with this um, planting program, and the answer is no. The species that we're introducing are, are native grasses that are going to grow up on the shoreline. The issue at Indian Lake is, is weeds, pond weeds, essentially type um, in, in the water, and that won't be an issue at all with the plants that we plan to introduce. Yes? I have just a question on semantics. You said you, you talked about nitrogen recovery and then ammonia recovery. Is, is that significantly different or is that the same thing? The same thing. Okay. So we're basically doing ammonia recovery because that's primarily the, the, the well, it's, it's, the, it's the ammonia or the nitrogen source is the ammonia that's available in the manure for plant usage. So, Thank you. yep. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. As you can see, she has a lot on her plate and she's a very busy girl, so we appreciate the time that she uh, comes and spends with us. Um, I guess I already flipped the screen, so you knew you were up. Uh, today we have another special guest. It's uh, Jasmine Grusnickel from the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. Uh, it's been tremendous interest on this lake here recently with uh, bird watching and so I'll just turn it over to her but she's got some uh, some facts and uh, interesting things about uh, being able to come here and observe the wildlife. Thank you and, and uh, I'm glad to be here. Find some place to put this. All right so I'm here to, today to talk about birding. So I've been a wildlife officer for for 15 years now, all that time pretty much in Miami County. But birding is something that anyone can do, no matter your experience. I was introduced to birding back when I was in 4-H in the early 90s. Uh, we would go on special field trips to go see great blue herons because they were not common at that point in time. If you, if you can imagine how far birding has come since the early 90s to now. And that's why it's great to see some of the lake improvement projects, some of the um, H2O projects and things of that nature to increase that habitat in the area to then promote ecotourism as well, which is obviously a big thing with this area around the lake. So with that, birding is huge. Birding is for everyone. Birding is something that you need little to no experience to get out and do. Uh, things that I would recommend having that are definitely beneficial would be field guides and binoculars, they can help. You don't necessarily need them if you have a giant bald eagle or pelican flying next to you, 
but for the smaller birds that is something that is beneficial and this is very topical this time of year this week for those of you that are not birders this is what is known as the biggest week of american birding it is a festival that is in ohio is put on by black swamp bird observatory and the division of wildlife up at mcgee marsh and it promotes the neotropical migrants coming through our area in this just expansive migration uh, that these birds from South America are flying all the way up to their breeding grounds in Canada for the most part. That is why I brought warbler guides. Now, even though I, I mentioned McGee Marsh, these birds are stopping over here all throughout Ohio and especially areas where there is habitat around lakes and things of that nature where there's a lot of bugs for them to eat and, and really forage. I was here uh, earlier this week at a park near the um, St. Mary's River and I, I got out and there were warblers bouncing all over the place. Black-throated blues, uh, black-throated greens, uh, vireos. So they are here and it's something that you can keep in mind as far as if you want to go out birding yourself or if you want to introduce something, someone to it. But then also, since we have a lot of people traveling up to go to McGee Marsh right now, they may want to stop here to see what birds you have too. That's why I posted, or I have, oh, next slide, how do I advance? Just over, there we go. That's why I have these two links right here. Uh, Birdcast, Birdcast is one of my absolute favorite websites to visit during spring migration. Uh, and are these hyperlinks? <laughs> well, I don't want to mess it up. So visit, visit BirdCast, and what you'll see, this uses Doppler radar to then track birds as they're moving uh, from their winter locations, to their summer location, back and forth. Just like it's tracking our weather, they can pull out the information of bird migration. This is absolutely huge if you plan on birding or following migration right now also. So you'll see it, that it just lights up during the night because that's when most of these birds are, are migrating. Uh, and I will be happy to show any of you this on my phone because I'm, I'm checking it daily right now with the bee migration, that you can see how these birds are moving at night. This week in particular will be especially huge because we have this warm front. Birds like to move and they like to migrate when they have that southerly wind that makes it easy for them to fly. They're normally stopping at big bodies of water because they see that and they're like, ooh, I need to eat more. I don't know how, long, how big that water is. Now with the lake out here, hopefully they can see or know this area well enough, but that's why McGee Marsh is such a big birding spot. It's listed as one of the top 10 birding locations in all of the world, it's so big. Because these birds flying up from South America, they spend two days or more traveling the Gulf of Mexico, okay? So then once they Sometimes they fly Cape May, New Jersey area. Sometimes they fly kind of more Appalachian area. But they see uh, Lake Erie and all of a sudden they go, oh crap, we have the Gulf of Mexico again. I need a land, I need to eat, I need to eat a lot. So they stop, they eat. And that's why we have them hang out there for so long. So this week, lots of southerly winds, gonna warm up. We're gonna have those birds really push through and they'll be here all over the place too. So that is one really cool thing about this week and this time of year in particular. And you have your warbler guides. So get out, find, find some birds. Yeah. The marsh you're talking about is set up by Mommy Bay? Yes, it's very, very close to Mommy Bay um, next to Ottawa Wildlife Refuge. Yep. There's a board, there is a boardwalk that is um, owned by the Division of Wildlife or the, or the wildlife area is a Division of Wildlife property that the boardwalk is primarily used for birding during really about a two month period of migration, but especially this week. If, um, if nothing else, uh, even if you're not a birder, it is great people watching. You get to see people from all over the world come in, pack in on these boardwalks that, I mean, they're maybe eight foot wide with huge cameras that just photography and stuff like crazy. So, so not necessarily do you have to be a birder in, in a sense that you have a bird list that you're checking off to see everything that you've seen, but then you also have people that just like photography. 
and, and like taking pictures of pretty things. So, so it, is, it is really, really cool. Okay, so BirdCast is one of my favorite um, websites to visit. The other one is eBird. Do we have any people that use eBird in here? Okay, so eBird, and this is one way that you can boost ecotourism in the area, to be honest. If you are a birder, download the eBird app or go to their website. You do have to sign in to this one and, and create a membership. Uh, I believe the app may cost a couple dollars, but uh, online, I believe it's free. So eBird tracks your bird sightings. So if you see a bird, you enter in the place and time that you saw it. I can tell you that before arriving here today, I stopped by the wildlife refuge here at the lake and I saw two black neck stilts. That is considered rare for the area. Anytime you have a rare bird that's seen, you have birders wanting to see it. So it brings people into the area by tracking the birds and movements that you're having. The pelicans, people are flocking up here to see the pelicans. It's a love-hate situation. I'll talk a little bit more about pelicans here in a bit, but, um, but it's something that a lot of people don't get the chance to see. So it is huge to track those birds and get people here to then experience it. And, and it's everyone. So that's what I'll say about birding migration. And now let's talk about some more specific issues to, to this area. So bald eagles, populations are thriving. It's estimated that there's over 800 nests in the state right now. And around 15 here around Grand Lake. Driving around, you see tons of juvenile eagles, and, um, and then you're also seeing quite a few that are currently nesting as well. When taking pictures of eagles, 100%. Like I said, with birding, you have the people that have their bird checklist. You also have people that just like to, to take pictures of pretty things. With eagle photography, it's great to do, great to get the word out. I think any time that anyone is outside, it's a good thing. So. So keep in mind with any type of bird photography, make sure that you're on property where you have permission to be at. So you don't wanna go tramping along other people's property. That it's called criminal trespassing, bad. So, so we don't wanna do that, but we still want to get the opportunity to see them. Uh, eagle nests in particular, they are protected by 100 yards. Um, so a football field is a distance away that you have to be from an eagle nest. I will say that depending on maybe the, um, maybe the experience of the birds, uh, like how old they are or how long that nest has been established, they may be more skittish. If you see a new eagle nest and the bird flies away, even before you reach that 100 yard mark, it's a good thing to back off because you're disrupting that bird. Eagle nests are probably most uh, uh, vulnerable when they're on eggs and early chicks. That's when we want to make sure that we're not disrupting the birds more so than, than as those chicks get a little bit bigger. And, um, and you know that they don't need that mother for warmth and to protect them from predators quite as much. But, um, but definitely, which, which right now we're, we're in that down phase. They should be fledging June, July. Uh, so, so definitely photography of eagles, 100% fine, encouraged. Um, you know, it, it, the more people see of, on Facebook posts of birds being, being taken pictures of and that the opportunity is there to see these birds, it, it boosts that ecotourism again. The pelicans. So what you have up at Grand Lake, you don't necessarily have breeding birds and we probably won't see breeding birds at Grand Lake. Uh, it is a stopover during migration uh, for pelicans. Most of your breeding pairs are, are going to be up North Dakota area into Canada and they are ground nesting birds that, uh, that start nesting in around February, March. So right now their nesting period is already happening. This time of year you probably have a lot of birds that are still those migratory birds that are not going to be nesting. There are non-breeders of the year. Uh, so so that's why you, you still have some, you might have some hang out all summer long, but back earlier in the spring or late winter, that's why you had so many because you had more of them migrating through. As far as them eating fish, uh, yes, they eat fish. We eat fish, fish is good. So, but they do an interesting way of feeding that you'll typically have a flock and they'll, 
they, they're not like the brown pelicans that are diving deep into the water. They are uh, just paddling around in, the, in their little flock in little circles, round and round and round in shallow water, schooling fish. Once those fish are schooled up, they dip their head neck down and grab fish in that school. Most of the fish that they are catching are gonna be your rough fish, carp, suckers, things of that nature. Uh, I know with, uh, there have been some catfish farms, more of your um, fish farm areas that have had problems with, with pelicans, but typically on lakes, it, it's, it's not an issue with them. They're getting those rough fish, those forage fish. They are opportunistic, so if that crappie, or I mean, you don't typically see a, a lot of your bass and stuff school up and, and be in that type of situation, um, but they will eat anything. But they're not grabbing huge game fish either, because they can only eat something that is half the distance of their, or half the length of their bill. Because they put it in the pouch, the water, they, their pouch actually holds five gallons of water. Uh, so, so they um, expel that water and swallow the fish. So they're not, they're not really damaging or, or having any effect on, on fish population, especially a lake this big. Uh, so I see, I see giggling. <laughs> so, so, I mean, but you have cormorants out here. You have eagles out here. You have great blue herons. You have all sorts of birds. You have, um, you know, raccoons. You have, you have all sorts of things that are wildlife eating animals in this lake. It, it, it is a wild environment. So, um, so the pelicans really aren't that much of a concern. And, uh, and really, you know, at this time of year, they're, they're pretty much gone. Or, or they will be leaving in, with just a small population being here. All right. I talked really fast, so hopefully you guys understood all of that. Uh, I am willing to take any questions now. So I've read two different theories, at least two different theories about the, uh, about the eagles, and they're, you know, ornithologists talking nationwide. So the first one is that the lead poisoning is a big deal with the eagle deaths, and that's reducing, or, or reducing the advance of the population. And the second one is that we're running out of nesting sites, which are both are the case in Ohio, or which you asked me. So the question is concerning uh, uh, eagle nest expansion, uh, concerns with lead population, poisoning, population or growth. growth. It's been growing for the last, what, 20 years or whatever it's been, yes. 40 years. But it's, some people say it's stabilizing now, or maybe not even, you know. I, I, I don't believe that the eagle nest, uh, it, I, I don't think there is necessarily a stabilization. There's still lots of habitat here around the lake. It's a huge resource. Uh, me being from Miami County, we have the Great Miami River and the Stillwater River. I have seven nests in Miami County, and you know gravel pit quarries, uh, the river corridors. There's still tons of areas for these eagles to build nests, and they don't really seem to compete that much with one another. They'll compete with with osprey. You'll see an eagle attack an osprey, or it, it's known to happen. So you don't really have that competition there. They they cohabitate with each other um, well, well enough that um, I, don't, I don't know that they're that territorial towards one another, another. So as long as there's still babies being born, it takes five years before they reach sexual matur maturity. Um, and then even there, even then that first year, they may not be successful at actually having or producing eggs and, and hatching them out. So, so I think we, we will, we're seeing booms, but I think it's just gonna explode from here. I mean, with any type of animal, there's a carrying capacity. There's a limit to how much that environment can hold. So, but the good thing with eagles, they can fly and find someplace else and continue on going. So, so I, I think you, you might see, uh, you may not see as much of an expansion here at the lake, but those birds are flying and, and nesting someplace else. So, and, and, we're, and we're seeing that now because let's say, we did a study in 2020 for eagle nests and, and we were estimating around 720 eagle nests in the state at that time. Now we're saying there's over 800 or around that area. Uh, and, and, and you're going to have natural predation. Um, well, unfortunately, I'll say natural, but vehicle strikes, uh, eagles, one of the main causes of death for eagles is them eating roadkill off the side of the road and then they get hit by a car. So, um, so you are gonna have some 
say natural predation, but but yeah, vehicle collisions and things of that nature to thin out those birds and then those other birds kind of swing in and take their spot. How about the lead poisoning? Uh, I'm not familiar with how much lead poisoning is affecting eagles. I, I, it's definitely a possibility. Uh, so um, I think uh, groups, Glen Helen Raptor Center down in Yellow Springs is our, is our premier uh, raptor center here in this area that, uh, that birds that come in are tested there. Uh, so I'm not aware of any birds that have been found to have lead poisoning in this area. I could be wrong though, but, but most of the birds that we have and then we ship off to have tested go through Glen Helen Raptor Center down in Yellow Springs. Yeah, so, so bird flu is definitely a major concern this year. We, we've had a couple reports in Ohio, and we have lost some eagles due to it. Uh, you don't have bird flu so much in your songbirds, but waterfowl is the carrier for bird flu. Then when those waterfowl die, eagles uh, and you know some, some other raptors, uh, owls, things of those nature, they can eat on that dead waterfowl, and then they can track the disease. Any sick eagles that we have brought in are te uh, that we're able to test, we're testing. Um, and, and that goes for a lot of birds. And, and once again, that's going through Glen Helen Raptor Center for the most part, um, or we may um, send animals into the Department of Agriculture to have tested as well. So it just depends on the situation. But bird flu is definitely a major concern, and not only with our wild uh, populations, but a, a huge concern with the poultry industry. So. So it is something that is very closely being monitored, and hopefully things stay calm here in Ohio. No, no huge outbreaks that I'm aware of. Yes? There seems to be a lot of cormorants, and they, I know they tend to wipe out vegetation like on small islands and lakes. Do you have any thought of controlling those? Or? So my understanding is up at Grand Lake St. Mary is that uh, we do have a depredation permit that the Division of Wildlife uh, does try to reduce uh, cormorant nesting. So, and, and yes, their, their droppings are, it, it's acidic, it's killing the vegetation underneath where they're nesting at, uh, which then ruins the habitat for any other birds or other animals that might need that area. So it is an active program that the Division of Wildlife does, is to reduce those um, nesting populations. Well, uh, I, I don't know that we have many nesting pairs right, or nests. If you, if you are aware of where there is a nest at, then let us know. And it may be that our permit is restricted to certain areas, such as the refuge and, and, and those protected areas, let's say. So you don't think there's any in St. Island? Any nests on St. Island? I am not certain, but I'm not the officer that okay. patrols this area. Matt Hain is back in the back of the room. So. <laughs> Are cormorants nesting on safety island? Currently, no. Something went out there to look. No nesting pairs currently. So that's no nesting pairs on safety island right now, which is good. Okay, you had a question? As the eagles increase, will the osprey deeply decrease on the lake? Will eagles, uh, will osprey decrease as eagles increase is the question. And honestly, I don't know. The, I, you go to areas uh, like Florida, they, they're both there quite a bit. Uh, I think it just depends on the amount of resource that's, that's available. If they are both maybe fishing in the exact same area, one may attack the other one um, to say, hey, get out of my area and potentially kill that bird. But definitely other areas of, in the nation, both birds are seen quite commonly together. So I would assume that, that they don't, that an eagle population won't necessarily uh, push out an osprey population. It's, it's more of a competition, probably hunting ground area. Uh, oh. A couple or several times over the last couple of years, there have been spots of, I don't know, the sand eels or moving cranes fly very high. We're in that fly zone. Do any of them ever land in this area? So the question is on sandhill cranes and 
Um, and yes, sandhill cranes uh, absolutely will use this, um, this as a migration corridor. But then uh, from talking to another, another gentleman here today, he said that there's actually a nesting pair at Grand Lake. They do, we do have some nesting pairs up at St. Mary, or I'm sorry, Lake Erie. <laughs> so, so we have some nesting pairs up there too. So we are starting to see some nesting in Ohio, which is awesome news. Uh, they are amazing, cool birds to see uh, in migration also that you can have, a, especially if it's a wet field during migration, that you can have thousands of birds just standing there and, and they're eating those little mac micro invertebrates out of the soil. So, so yes, it, it very cool. And that's where um, some of the, the, the e-bird sightings uh, is, is such of a great thing because you can pull up a geographical area and see what birds are actually being sighted in that area um, within the past 24 hours if you want to. So, All right, with no other questions, like I said, I'm more than happy to show anyone either one of these websites and show them the features and how cool they are. Other than that, um, feel free to take a warbler guide on your way out there on the back table. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jasmine, for coming up. She said she lives about an hour away, so she took her Saturday morning to come and also like to thank Dave Failer for uh, arranging that, arranging her visit here. Um, up to about 2010, all we did was remove uh, the grasslands and the wildlife for the birds and everything. So you also got to thank everybody that since that time has replaced with wetlands and everything to let the wildlife start to flourish once again. Um, speaking of the local celebrity, Dave Failer, we'll have him come up and do a uh, park report. I am going to request from now on that I get to speak before Teresa or any special guests. Because they take a bunch of my material away. <laughs> <laughs> um, lake level currently is plus six inches. Um, not, it's not a very, it's not a real accurate reading because of the wind this morning. Um, so far this year we've got 7.11 inches of rain, 2.77 inches for April. And so far for May, we've got 1.69, which if you've been to my campground, you'd see why. <laughs> and you would believe me completely. Um, Mo Memorial Day is booked already. Juneteenth is booked, fully booked for the campgrounds. Fourth of July and Labor Day are also fully booked. Today we are about 50% capacity in the campgrounds. So camping season is in full swing and just going to get busier over the next couple weeks. We've installed some uh, new lights at Shelter 3. <coughs> we have a uh, quite a quite a big issue with birds in our shelter houses and trying to keep them clean so when people make reservations they uh, they don't um, get a bunch of bird issues in the can in those shelters so we're trying some new stuff um, we put some new LED lighting in there that instead of it being on all the time at night it at full capacity um, these LED lights actually have sensors in them and they dim way down and then if somebody starts moving around in there then they blow up to full lighting um, we're also hoping that may help a little bit with are uh, people that are looking for a place to reside that do not have a, uh, a home currently. Um, we've also and try we've also installed some bird be gone different di type of deterrents. Um, for some reason, I guess birds don't like the smell of grapes, so it's a grape smell, and also it's a. a uh, like a sticky silicone stuff that we put on top of the rafters where they would roost or nest or land. Um, none of it is harmful, so we don't have any issues there. But we're going to see what, what happens with that shelter house, and we may be doing it to all of them um, if it works well. All the park has finally been mowed um, as of 
earlier this week um, with all the rain and all the wet it's been a challenge to get out there and get everything mown um, but of course you know there's some areas that we haven't been able to get to yet uh, we made a repair to the ADA fishing pier at East Bank for some, re for some reason or another I don't know if it's the wind but it's actually taken that whole fishing pier and pushed it to the east so it's fallen off the foundation that holds that ramp that steel ramp that goes down to the concrete so we have some more repairs that need to be made that was just temporary but hopefully we'll get those uh, completed before September for the the big uh, ADA or our handicap fishing derby that we always have in September that Jeff organizes um, so I always try to do a thank you every every month this week's thank you goes to Adam Howe. He is an Eagle Scout and he has built a new amphitheater screen for us. So we've got that removed and given the camp hosts a week here to try and get it all uh, wire brushed and repainted. Um, we still have needs for lifeguards. All the positions have been filled so far with the exception of lifeguards. I have five and I need nine. So if you know anybody who would like to be a lifeguard, uh, those positions are open. Um, I have two that will pay twelve fourteen, and I have another one that will pay thirteen fourteen. Um, it's a, a lifeguard supervisor, so I haven't found that person yet. So if you know anybody looking, please let me know. Dredge op updates. The uh, as I'm sure many of you no have noticed this spring, it's been very, very, very windy. So the hodag is out. And it's been out since April 5th. Its line has been hit seven times by boaters, putting seven patches. We've had to put seven patches on that line already this year. Um, while dredging or during the weekend, the wave and wind action has been so bad that it's actually busted the line twice. Um, I was on the dredge for three years, and we had two dredges running those three years and we never had the line broke before. So this wind and wave action this year is, is really beating us up. It's also made it uh, impossible to get the line fused that we needed. Uh, just finally finished or finishing up on the line for uh, Brutus. So Brutus has been moved to the south side of the lake and he's in Montezuma. He's gonna be running in Montezuma Bay, um, both sides there and the, that line has been fused and it's ready to be hooked up as soon as the weather allows uh, the pump a little it's set up to begin for its repairs on 523 or on may 23rd so hopefully uh, that'll get done here pretty soon and we'll have a full dredge crew out there and pumping does anybody have any questions very good thank you Thank you, Dave. Uh, we have a uh, carp out tournament coming up June 3rd. Um, it's probably, I don't know, probably about the fourth, fifth time that we've done it. Uh, Zach Farrow is in charge of it. And uh, so it starts at 4 o'clock on uh, Thursday, or Friday, I guess, um, and ends up on Saturday at 2 o'clock. So it's a tournament, a lot of fun and a lot of benefit to the lake to get the carp out. Um, this slide also relates to that. It basically uh, mentions the benefits. Uh, carp are considered by some as phosphorus bombs. They stir up the bottom, it releases phosphorus, they excrete phosphorus, and they kill vegetation that feeds on the phosphorus. Plus they're nasty tasting little critters. So. Um, <laughs> We really don't have any need for them. We are once again this year gonna do the scavenger hunt. Um, last year was the first year of it. It was a family uh, event. And um, we just kind of put some obscure locations out on the lake, use clues, and the people travel around either by boat or car, and they, uh, they complete the circuit. And it'll be on Father's Day weekend. Um, this is actually a poster from last year. 
We are getting new posters printed up, but we are going to do the scavenger hunt on Father's Day weekend, Father's Day weekend, and it'll be on Saturday and Sunday again. It will not take two days to complete it. You could easily complete it in one day or even in one afternoon, but you have the option of doing either day, depending on your, your family's uh, plans for that weekend. We will also be doing the Bar Stew Open August 13th this year, which is a big uh, fundraiser for the LIA and a lot of fun. So just this is the first time we threw it out there that this is the date for the Bar Stew Open for 2022. I will mention what Teresa mentioned, and that is this is the last day to order plants. We have had very good interest in people wanting plants. Uh, the plants will be available next month after our meeting at 1130 they'll be out in the parking lot and i have everything organized for pickup and things like that so if you ordered plants please be here to, to pick those up and you'll have till midnight